Social Studies magazine. Uh, the like really wide open one. All right. So you should be on your social studies page. America the Beautiful. This doesn't have a lot of information. I just thought it'd be a nice little flow one to stop at. Um, uh, will the pen work today? No. Oh, oh, disconnected. I want it to be connected. Oh, connected. Cool. All right. So hopefully it works. So anyway, so it's a nice picture. And here's just a little little insert. Catherine Lee Bates wrote the words to America the Beautiful after traveling from Massachusetts to Colorado in 1893. That is a really old song, 1893. Her trip across the country took her through the Appalachian Mountains, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountains. Do you think her trip inspired the words of the song? Uh, probably. If we look at her, you've probably heard this song, even if you don't really remember it. Oh, me. I'm not going to sing. But, oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. Okay, well, that would be the plains, waves of grain. Um, for purple mountains, majestic. Okay, she went through the Appalachian Mountains above the fruited plains. Anyway, so she wrote this song after traveling. Okay, so, you know, she was inspired by the beautifulness of. America. So that's just fun little thing. Catherine Lee Bates. Maybe we'll listen to the song one day. Okay? Can someone remind me what we learned about yesterday? Abby, what did we learn about yesterday? We learned about... Oops. Oh, okay. That's okay. What do you know what we learned about? We learned about... Where the tropical, where every you could always turn back page. Where um, what we were and what the others. Okay, were. so read that word at the top for me, love. What did we learn about in general? Climate regions. Yes, we learned about climate regions yesterday. And remember, lovely. United States has so many different climate regions. Can someone raise their hand and remind me what climate region us in Indiana are in? And if you don't remember, flip back a page. We highlighted things for a reason. Uh, Gabby. We are in the temperate zone. We are in the temperate zone, which what does that mean? We have what? Malik? All four seasons. We have all four seasons, colder in the winter, warmer in the summer. And then remember, on your page, what we highlighted, the important things we highlighted were each little word of the description. That way, later on your assessment, or not necessarily assessment, but your review that we're going to do like Monday or Tuesday. No, not Monday. It's not going to be here. Maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't really know. I uh, haven't decided yet. If you have a question about coastal climate, you can easily find coastal because we have that highlighted. Okay? So, um, I enjoyed what we learned about yesterday. I thought that was interesting. Yes. I didn't know. Yes, so you were not here yesterday. So, Ethan, after class, I can tell you what parts you need to read, and you can even look off of neighbors to see what you need to highlight, okay? Okay. You only missed those two pages that we read. No big deal. Okay? okay? So, we are going to continue on with our next section. So, turn the page from America the Beautiful, and we're going to learn about vegetation regions. When I say vegetation, what, what comes to mind? Someone tell me, vegetation, what am I talking about, Mason? Something doesn't eat meat. That's a vegetarian. I'm going to disagree with you. But I, those words do sound similar. But no, vegetation regions. What do you think of, Miss Isabel? Disgusting broccoli Okay. vegetables. So I'm not thinking about vegetables or vegetarians. Feel free to look at the pictures on your map right now and uh, maybe maybe help me out a little bit. Mr. Malik. Uh, what comes to mind is forest and grassland. Yeah, the forest, the grassland, the vegetation are the plants outside, okay? So we're going to be learning about the different type of vegetation or plants in different areas. We should not be coloring with our highlighter. Our highlighter is going to be a tool to help us with the important things, okay? We are not just coloring with our highlighter. So vegetation regions... Just like there's climate regions, there's vegetation regions, and there are different things growing in different areas, which we already know, right? Because we talked about yesterday, are palm trees growing in Indiana? No. No. Yeah. Do we have big old cactuses growing in Indiana? 
No, because we don't have the right climate for it. So our vegetation is different depending on our climate as well. So if right at the very top next to vegetation region is where we're going to start. And it says when European settlers first arrived in North America, one of the first things they noticed was the... We can do it thing. Ah was the vegetation. In the east, forests were everywhere. So the east, that is where they came. They came through the Atlantic Ocean from England and they stopped in the east in where's my United States map? Is this my United States map? Yeah, it's your United States. This is the east. So this is where they, you know, they arrived around Delaware and Virginia and Maryland and all those lovely areas. And it was full of full of forests. Okay, so, my ancestors discovered Indiana. What? I'm gonna guess my ancestors discovered Indiana. Okay, but right now we're focusing on just this, okay? So, the trees provided wood that settlers used to build houses, to cook, to keep warm. The American Indians who lived in the forests of the East farmed in small clearings, but early settlers cut down whole forests so they could grow crops in the European way. So when they first arrived in the East, there were forests everywhere. And a lot of them were cut down because while well, people really needed them to build homes and stuff, they were able to be successful because they were able to build homes. But then people also took away giant forests just so they could grow crops. So they may have cut down a little too many. I don't know. And then it says, in areas, natural vegetation is the plants that grow naturally there. Those plants reflect the landscape, soil, and the climate of that area. That whole section is highlighted. That is important. That is what we talked about before we started reading. Natural vegetation are the plants that grow there naturally. So Mrs. Kneifel could plant her cactus outside on the ground, okay? I could do that. But I brought it there. It did not naturally grow there, okay? A cactus is not going to naturally grow in Indiana. Palm trees are not going to naturally grow in Indiana. That's just not what we have. So those are not natural vegetation. They could grow here, but they probably necessarily won't. Why, why don't I see anything highlighted? I, I told you guys to highlight something. Why aren't we highlighting? I highlight. It says, it's on the second page, it says, in areas, natural vegetation is the plants that grow there naturally. That means that they have been there forever, okay? Those plants reflect the landscape, soil, and the climate of the area, just like we talked about yesterday. If, depending on the climate, depends on what can grow there. Same with soils. Some trees and plants need really good, rich soil and a place that has that arid, dry, desert climate. Well, it's not going to grow crops very well because their soil is dry and sandy. So you have to have the right things to grow things or the right stuff to grow things successfully. Okay? Good? Yeah. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. Let's go to the next part. So now I have this lovely map of the United States. Oh. Okay, well, anyways, here's my map. I just kind of cut it off a little bit, but you can see it on your paper. And you can see that there are about five different climate regions through our United States-Mexico section, right? Can we all see that through Canada? There's desert. We know what a desert is. Grassland, so there's probably a lot of grass there, right? Forest, tundra. Tundra's going to be really cold. And polar desert and ice. So the United States is in what type of vegetation region? Not, did I say the United States? I meant Indiana. What vegetation region is Indiana in, Isabel? The forest. Yes, forest. So we are going to go learn, well, what does that mean? Right? I want you to go to the forest section on your thing. There's this nice, beautiful picture. Woo. Can we highlight forest? No. Uh... Yeah, you can highlight forest. I know it's in the picture, and I might have you highlight more important things within forest, but yes, please highlight the word forest. That way it's easy to find if you have a question, or if you have a picture thing about that, um, or if you have a question about that later. So let's read about a forest. And if you saw, forest is a big chunk, right? You see so much 
is that forest. The whole east, part of the Midwest, part of that Canada up there, big chunks of forest. So now let's read about it. It says, a forest is a large area full of trees and underbrush. Forest is the natural vegetation in areas with plenty of rain. Not your head if we get plenty of rain in Indiana. Yeah, so that makes sense. Not your head if you've seen lots of trees in Indiana. Yeah, so forest makes sense, right? This includes, sorry, this includes most of the eastern U.S. and large areas of the West, especially in mountains and the Pacific Northwest. Hawaii and the southern part of Alaska also support vegetation, forest vegetation. So that's interesting. Like yesterday when we looked at climate, climate in Hawaii and Alaska were way different than what we had in Indiana. Like they weren't near the same color, but today Indiana has some same colors in uh, vegetation. So that's super interesting. I do want you to highlight the first two sentences of forest itself. A forest is a large area full of trees and underbrush. Please highlight that. And the next sentence, forest is the natural vegetation in areas with plenty of rain, okay? So that's really defining what forest is, okay? So please highlight that, okay? And like obviously the background's dark, but if you go over those white letters, it's gonna be highlighted, okay? You can see a little bit of dark green. Yeah. All right, so now there's gonna we're gonna learn a little bit more about the forest. Let's learn some more. Oh no. Oh no. Um, no. Okay, I'll have to start then scroll down. It says, well, there's a picture of a nice little black bear, so cute. It says the tallest plants in forests are the trees. Not your head if you knew that when you're in a forest, the trees are the tallest. Uh, or is a grass gonna be as tall as a tree? No. 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 Is a flower gonna be as tall as a tree? No. 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 That, of course, plants are gonna be the tallest in a forest. But many other plants such as grasses, shrubs, and moss also grow in forests. We know that, we live in this area. You've all seen shrubs, you've all seen grasses, you've all seen moss. This is not a new thing for us where we live. If someone was reading this that lived in the desert, they might not know that. And then it says, some forests include evergreen trees with needles like pines. Other forests are mostly broad leaved trees like oaks. The forests in North America support a rich variety of wildlife, including bears, mooses, and many other species. Forests in our area, in Indiana right here, what is a species that is in a forest that we see a lot and sometimes calls us car? We don't have moose, mooses here. Um, and we don't normally have bears. Every once in a while a bear comes down from Michigan. But what animal am I thinking of, Phoebe? Deer. deer. We have a lot of deer that are in forests and they come out on rails and they cause car, car accidents and all those things. Well, other places don't have deer like we have. And um, so in the forest are great places for animals to live because there's lots of places to hide. There's lots of food from, you know, walnuts and acorns and all those like wild berries and stuff, okay? So forest is a great place for lots of animals to live. That's why we have so many species around us. Rush. Uh, one time when, my, when me and my dad were at Tennessee, our family, we were driving through the woods. He was like, keep your eye out for, bear, for black bears. And we, and we found none black bears, but we went to the top of the mountain and there was a nice view of the whole entire place with where to end up where that mouth with the fire was caused on the mountain. All right, so nice Rush view. just said he was talking about Tennessee and black bears. Guess what? If we look at Tennessee on the map, which is underneath Kentucky, which is underneath Indiana, guess what? That's in a forest vegetation region as well. So they also have animals like bears and stuff like that. Alex. I I got out of my pool and I decided to walk in the woods and I found it very deer in the mountain. Yeah, love me some deer. Yeah, my, my sister once saw a deer when we were driving home from church. <laughs> nice. And I didn't even see it. I was like, I was like just, like just staring my head out. Yeah, window. that happened. This is Michael's husband's a hunter, so I actually have like some deer like heads in my house. You know? Oh, ew. Um, ew. It hurt me. I'll send. You, I'll show you a picture someday. No. What? Oh, no. Hey, I can't hear Ethan. Are you going to tell me a story or what? No. Okay. Uh, what? Are we going to highlight anything in the, the last section? No. Okay. No, that's good. 
All right, next we're gonna read about grasslands. And grasslands is what color on your map? Green. That light, light green, which makes me think of grass, personally. So I want you to highlight the word grassland. You can see a picture of a deer. Is that a deer? Yeah. Yeah. Is it antelope? Ooh, that's what it kind of looks like an antelope. All right, now let's read about grasslands. Grasslands occur where there is a not enough moisture to support trees. Highlight that. That's important. We need to know. In grasslands, there's not a lot of trees. They don't have enough moisture. That means they don't get enough rain and stuff like that. So you should be highlighting. Grasslands occur where there is not enough moisture to support trees. You should be highlighting that right now. I can't find it. Well, it's the first sentence in grasslands, bud. Oh. First sentence. In the United States, grasslands are found on the Great Plains and the western part of the Eastern Plains. The eastern plains support taller grasses because they get more rain. The drier Great Plains are dominated by shorter grasses. Some grasslands include shrubs and even a few trees. So if the places that are in the vegetation or the grassland vegetation, some, it's not like every single grass is the exact same, same length. They get a little more rain, guess what? The grass is gonna be a little bit taller. That makes sense. You get more water, you grow more. All right, so grassland. Can someone name a state that's within the grassland for me? Uh, what state's in the grassland? You know, just by looking, because obviously it doesn't say. Abby? Mm, North Dakota? Yes, North Dakota is in the grasslands, which means South Dakota is, and Nebraska, and part of Texas, and Oklahoma, and um, yeah, and, um that's all I can think of right now. And Iowa. And Iowa. So those are awesome grasslands, just fun little extra knowledge. Yes, it's a and Montana is also in the grasslands. Sweet. All right, we're gonna continue on. We only have 20 minutes and I wanna get through this whole section today. All right, it says, the grasslands of North America support herds of grazing animals like bison, elk, and antelope. Other animals that depend on grasslands include, uh, Oh, wait, I got it. Include prairie dogs and many grassland birds. Fun fact, Mrs. Kneipel has a friend right now that is currently in, which state is he in? He's in some state that I cannot think of currently, but it's a grassland state. Is it Montana? I know it's not Montana. He is in some state currently, and he is actually elk hunting. Um, elk season in whatever state he's in that I can't remember. Oh, wait, it's New Mexico. He's in New Mexico. New Mexico elk season opened up yesterday, in case you were curious. So he's hunting elk. Elk are ginormous animals. And um, oh. antelope, I feel like, are a lot like deer. The little thing. What? What? Do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. No? What? I cannot hear you, Zoe. What? Elks? I was trying to explain them. They're a very large animal. They have antlers. They have four... Pause, pause, legs. We can look up an um, elk later. They're That's very large animals. What? Look it up. What you tell us? We will. I just said we only have 20. Now we have 17 minutes, okay? We got to get through this. If we have extra time, we can look up some animals later. So antelope are kind of like deer. Prairie dogs are not like regular dogs. Like it's not like a dog just living out there. They're a different type of animal. Anyways, grassland animals are gonna eat a lot of grasses. Okay, okay. Mason, stop making a ton of noise and please sit up. Any questions about the grasslands? If not, we're gonna head on to the desert. desert. And can anyone name a state that is desert? Looking at your map where it's like that brown, orange, that's not orange. How about like brown or beige? Naked state over, over there, that is not a coffee color. Name a state that is over there, Alex. Utah. Utah. Nevada. Um, part of Mexico. Part of California. Washington. Part of Idaho. Um, all of Iowa. those. No, Iowa is not part of that. Part of Colorado. Part of all of. Them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You don't need to shout out if I call on you. You can raise your hand and answer. Okay. Yes. Like yeah. Yep. All right. So desert, we know what's going to be dry there. So it says desert is found in the driest parts of the world. 
generally in the arid climate zone. I need you to underline that first sentence. And we knew that because Mrs. Kripal literally just talked about a minute ago when I said arid climate, arid climate, and I was talking about desert. Be highlighting the first sentence about deserts. They're found in the driest parts of the world. Well, no doubt. Okay, like I hope you knew the desert was dry, right? Oh, no, I didn't know. In the United States, this includes parts of the Southwest. Most deserts get less than four inches of rain a year. Okay, four inches is like this much. That is not that much rain. Like the other day when we had that rain, I'm trying to think what, like two weeks ago when we had that rain, we literally at my house, we got an inch and a half of rain in one rain, one rainstorm, inch and a half. That would be like over a quarter of what they get the entire year. So that is very little rain. It's like, yeah, they get very, very little rain. Desert plants include cactuses, shrubs, and grasses. They can survive very hot and very cold temperatures as well as extreme drought. And if you're like, Mrs. Kneifel, why would it be cold during, why would it be cold in the desert? Can someone remind me what's specific about that arid climate that we talked about yesterday? Can we look back to yeah, feel free to look back. Why does it say very cold? What does that have to do with anything? I should see everyone looking back right now. Well, you can look too. Go find arid. Go look. Yes, Zoe, we went over that. Mason. Very low rainfall, big day today, and summer to winter temperatures. Yeah, remember, we talked about yesterday. It's going to be so hot in the desert, but once that sun goes down, it is cold. So it's a big temperature change, and the plants that live there are just able to survive it. Go them. Okay? Woo. Fabulous. So they're able to survive that extreme drought, though, because four inches of rain a year, not that much. And then it says, like desert plants, desert animals are adapted to living in harsh conditions. So adapted just means that they're able to survive where they are. Okay. If you're, excuse me. If you're, you know, able to adapt, that means you're able to, you know, handle change or go with your situation. So it says the kangaroo rat never needs to drink water. It gets all its water it needs from the plants it eats. Okay, that's interesting. You know what happened if you never drink water? You wouldn't be very healthy. So it never has to find a puddle to drink. It can eat a plant and any moisture in that plant helps it. Other animals like the desert tortoise can store waters in their bodies to use later. Many desert animals are active at night to avoid extreme daytime heat. How about we underline that last sentence, that many desert animals are active at night to avoid the, the extreme daytime heat. That's important to know. Like, animals aren't going to be going outside when it's 120 degrees and get burned in the sun. They're going to be smart. They're going to be more nocturnal. They're going to wait until it's cooler because they're able to tell the difference with the temperatures. Okay? Any question about desert? I'm trying, yeah? Kangaroo. What about a kangaroo rat? That's not a question. It's cute. Okay, well, I said any questions about the desert, not comments, okay? All right, and this next little section you do not have in your thing because it says learn more, okay? So just look at my board because you don't have this, okay? This is our extra little insert of information. And it says, the amount of rainfall in an area determines the plants and animals that live there. Yeah, we literally already know that. We know just from what we've read in the past that some animals can survive in the desert because they don't need a lot of water. Some animals cannot rush. Do you hear me speaking? That means you're not. Same with you, Ethan. Let's focus, okay? We only have 12 more minutes. Okay. So, um, we have already talked about that. If an animal needs a lot of water, it's not going to be able to survive in the desert. So, depending on the rainfall determines the plants, can determines the vegetation, basically. For example, Plants and animals in very dry areas must be able to survive without water. People in these areas also have to find ways to limit their water use. That's another thing that we uh, take for granted here in Indiana. We really never have a problem with our water sources. We don't ever really face the water shortage. But in other places where they're in that dry and arid climate, they're going to have things like droughts. And they, um, when they have droughts, then they don't necessarily have a lot of fresh drinking water. So people have different ways of saving water, like taking really short showers or like 
reusing water and, um, you know, different things like that. Or they collect rainwater to use and stuff. So that is something that we are super lucky to have in Indiana is we don't really suffer droughts where we need to conserve water. That doesn't mean you shouldn't conserve water, but it's not a necessity, but you should. What's one way to conserve water? Anyone? Anyone know? How can we conserve water? Ethan? No, I mean, that. I guess we conserve the water you have. I mean, like, use less. How about when you're brushing the teeth? Instead of leaving the water running the whole time, you shut it off in between. Or if you're going to take a shower, have everything ready and get in the shower, then turn it on instead of turning it on while you're, you know, out of the shower. Or uh, maybe doing less loads of laundry. Um, there's all different types of th ways to conserve water, but um, people in other parts of the country, especially in the West, that is something they have to deal with every single day. Like if they wash the dishes, they're going to save that water and then use that water to water their plants or they're going to use it to flush their toilet later, things like that. Okay? Because if you pour water into a toilet, it'll flush. You know, we don't really have to worry about things like that because we live in Indiana. So that was just our little learn more thing. Dun, 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 dun. Now let's talk about the tundra. I see snow. I see little plants. Mason, sit up. Zoe, look. Is there a reason your magazine is closed? Are we done? No. Let's stay with us, okay? All right. So the tundra is found in a cold, dry areas where the ground is almost always frozen. The landscape is usually flat, and the plants are mostly short, hardy shrubs. I want you to highlight those two sentences. I like those two sentences. It tells us a lot about the tundra. A sturdy shrub is going to be a shrub that can withstand wind and other things like that. It's not going to be some puny little plant, okay? The first two sentences under tundra, yes, I like. So they got some sturdy plants. And this plants in the tundra can also survive extreme cold, and obviously extreme cold. If it's always frozen there, it's going to be cold, and drought. They can even go months without sunlight. Although the tundra zone can be snowy, plants can't use the water in the snow and soil because it's frozen most of the year. So even though there's snow, which you think, oh, well, snow is made of water, precipitation, all that, it, um, it's not like the snow necessarily melts and then goes into the soil and the plants suck it up. That's just not really how it works because it's just always frozen. So um, can someone tell me where a tundra area is? Uh, uh, Gabby? A tundra area is like um, some of Alaska and... Yeah, so like way up part of Canada, no, yeah, part of Alaska and some of Canada, then way up even higher in like the Arctic zone. And then the cold. So, um, yeah. So then it says, despite the extreme conditions found in vegetation zone, many wildlife species live there, which is interesting. You think like who wants to live? Well, not who, but what animal wants to live where it's almost always frozen? These animals are adapted, which means they're used to. Remember, if they're adapted, you're used to it. They're adapted. They're adapted to tundra's cold, dry, and often dark winter conditions. The Arctic fox is a good example. Compared to other foxes, it has shorter ears and the amount and blah, 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 shorter ears. Oh my god. All right, so compared to other foxes, it has shorter ears to reduce the amount of skin exposed to the cold air. It also has very thick fur. Why would we want very thick fur if we lived in the tundra? Why would we want very thick fur if we lived in the tundra, Phoebe? To keep you warm. Yeah, to keep you warm. The fur is going to cover your skin. No skin will be showing. If you have skin showing, you might get frostbite. But with that fur over them, it's going to keep them warmer and keep them a lot safer. Alex. I just said that, buddy. Okay, but yes, if you you wouldn't want to not have that fur. Yes. My dad bought my stepmom a fur fur blanket for at out for work, and 
and we were at we were at this place to go on a nature walk. On our way out, Jenny said, my stepmom sent a picture to my dad of her had her makeup over her face like a Viking and had that thing right on like on her. She was that was awesome. Right on. Like Thank you for the story. She, if she kept a, she kept a picture of his axe or something, his Viking axe. Yeah, good up. Vikings used to have fur. All right. Like, you know, not the physically, like on themselves, you know, they kill animals, they have Viking fur. Anyways, this is another learn more thing. So you don't necessarily have this, but it's a, a map that's changing colors as we watch it. And it's saying the annual precipitation in inches. So if it's bright red, it's five to 10. If it's orange, 10 to 15. If it's 15 to 20 and so on. So in Indiana, we are the green and green. So if we get between a fifth, up where we live, we get between 40 and 50 inches a year of precipitation. And precipitation doesn't have to be just rain. It can also be like um, snow. Okay. Precipitation includes snow and rain. So that's just a fun little map. I like that. Interactive shenanigans. Yeah, that, there's people that get even more, especially up here in like Washington and Oregon. They get between like 100 and 140. They get a lot of rain up in Washington. And then down here in Florida, and Louisiana and um, whatever the state is, I can't think of what it's called on the coast right here. They get a lot, a lot of rain too in yeah. the. Um, is it by the ocean? No, Alaska's not on here, but down here is what I just said. They get a lot of rain down here from hurricanes, precipitations. It like rains every day in Florida, so lots of rain. And the last little part just says this map shows the average amount of precipitation that falls in the contiguous United States. Someone remind me what is contiguous? You mean? What does contingent mean? We, everyone should have their hand up. What does contingent mean? Zoe. What? No. No. Contingent. Mason. States that are touching. Yeah, the states that are touching. So Hawaii and Alaska are not on this map because they don't touch the United States. So just the contiguous United States is what this map shows. And here's what Mrs. Michael just said. Precipitation includes rain, snow, sleet, and hail. Precipitation is not just rain. It is all four of those things, okay? Sleet is like snow and rain mixed, hail, ice balls. Those are all precipitations. And then um, the driest is the red. See, that's the driest, all right? Are there any questions over this lovely section today? What? So, Zoe, I know how much you highlighted. I told you what's highlight. All right, we are just about out of time with social studies today. So, I need you to put this away um, for tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm still talking, Rush, okay? Tomorrow, we will continue on with reading our next section. Um, personally, I really like what we're learning about right now. I like learning about uh, North America. Um, so I hope you guys are enjoying this as well. Hopefully you highlight it along with me because it is important because you're going in next week sometime, I think either Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to have a review over these the second half of this section. And remember, not so many of us did amazing on our first review, which we went over together yesterday. Zoe, I literally just told Rush that I'm still talking. And he didn't need to interrupt me for that. And now you are. No, you may not. All right. So thank you for joining you too. Eric, I'm going to make sure to send this recording. That way you know what to highlight later since you didn't have your magazine with you. I will see you guys at Language Arts, okay? Language Arts is going to be at 120 after recess, okay? So I'll see you then. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And you just can't see. Bye.